You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> You're kidding me. You love it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Are you really going to do it that way? <laughs> you sure you won't want another take? <laughs> Sadly, I am going to do it that way. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome, everybody, to another astoundingly entertaining episode of That Gets My Goat. Astoundingly entertaining. That's right. That's a lot to live up to. Luckily, I am ready and able. Yes, you are up to the task. Indeed, I ang. All right. So, you called this particular meeting, I believe. Call the meeting to order and tell people, or do you want me to pretend that I called the meeting to order? It doesn't matter to me. I can. I just thought it would be an interesting thing to get together and talk about our recent exploits on our own blogs. We have three blogs. That, One, a two, a three that belong to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. There's one main blog, which is the show's blog. And uh, on that is where you will find these podcasts, for example. And it is also where we announce things like, hey, you can find us on this podcast over here. Or, I just did this over here, that kind of stuff. You know, or our guest appearances. And on occasion, we'll do a a regular kind of a blog, but the more regular, just talk about what stuff we're interested in, that kind of thing, appears on our separate personal blogs. Mine's BigAnklevich.blogspot.com, and yours is RishOutfield.blogspot.com. And on there, you can find us talking about stuff that we think personally is funny or interesting, or sometimes we go out and we'll talk about, hey... I see this especially a lot on your blog. Hey, I just released this audiobook that I was the narrator for on, and you can find it on Amazon now. Or, hey, I just, uh, I published this story of mine on Smashwords, and you can go and get it there. But recently, and we did an episode about this a few weeks ago, we decided to do a live blogging a story challenge. And so I think our episode that we did, we were partway through this process. You know, no, no, we were... I think I think it was a ankle cast. Oh, was that the ankle cast that we talked about that? Oh, well, you have no idea what I'm talking about because nobody listens to that. One buddy listens to this, but nobody listens to the ankle cast. So, wow. All right. So you guys have no idea. Um, let me introduce this concept to you then. We did a live blogging a story event where... Basically, the deal was we wrote the story and published it immediately. And we didn't even finish the story. It was you wrote the portion of the story that day, and then you published it at the end of the day. You're like, okay, I got 500 words today. Here they are. And then the next day you'd write again. Okay, I got 900 words today. Here they are. And we just kept going like that until we got to the end of the story that we were working on. And each of us did a story. I think... Weird crap happened with your story because you were rewriting a story that you had written before and then you lost the notebook to. And then halfway, not even halfway through, all of a sudden you found that notebook. And you're like, damn it, okay, now what do I do? And you wound up kind of publishing what you had written in the notebook but sprucing it up a little, right? You would make some changes to it as you typed it up. Yeah, essentially, you were seeing the second draft rather than the first draft of that story after I'd found the notebook, which isn't really fair because it's supposed to be a live blogging thing. But, man, I'm really skittish, as everybody who's ever listened to the Dune Steve knows, about sharing my work, just as it is. You know, even if it's something that I'm really proud of and I've gone through four drafts, I still don't want to share it with anybody. But to actually just write something and put it out there that day for everybody to ostensibly judge can be terrifying. But, you know, that writer that you follow the tenets of a lot, uh, David Wesley... Dean Wesley Smith. He, Dean Wesley Smith, he, he said, publish everything that you write. Don't 
agonize over it and rewrite and rewrite and all that stuff. Just send it out there, publish it, and go on to the next thing. He's a big believer in quantity, not necessarily over quality, but that quantity matters. You know, if you have 10 stories, that's 10 times more likely to sell than one really good story. You know what I mean? And, you know, I both agree and disagree with that, but there's no arguing with the numbers. You're right. If you've written and published 10 stories, you're 10 times more likely to sell a story than just the one really good story you've written and rewritten and polished and, and gotten perfect. And so sort of following his advice for writers, with, uh, I tried to put out stories out there, uh, you know, and, and even if I don't think that they're very good, people can check them out. You and I both talked about doing anthologies where we include stories that we don't even like. But it's like, well, you already paid for this anthology, so it's not like you're really paying for this bad story. It's like I'm throwing it in for free, and I don't feel bad selling you a story I think is bad if you get with it three other stories that I don't think are bad. Yeah, and I think you were saying, and I don't know if this was a Dean Wesley Smith thing that you were quoting or what it was, but you were saying that somebody like that had said, no, you don't get to judge whether this is a good or a bad story because your judgment isn't you know, reliable. You are too close to it to be able to say. And on top of that, who knows? You know, one story works well and is great to some people, whereas to other people it's not good. And then, you know, it's completely different for another. You, you put out two stories and it could be two completely different sets of people that like the one versus the other. And you never can know what somebody's going to really dig on and not dig on. Something will speak to some people and other things will speak to others. So, you know, you, somebody anyways had said, yeah, you, you just got to put out everything. That's really good advice. I, I, I mean, we've talked about that. There are three or four stories that I have that I hold really dear that I think, oh, okay, this is a really, really good story. There was a story I wrote called, well, I can't even remember what it was called. You may know what it was called. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll, it was probably called. I think that's... Right. When the evening comes around and it's time to hit the town, where do you go? Was the full title. <laughs> um, our college professor said he would have liked it a lot more if it was called Your. <laughs> Anyhow... No, he would have liked it if it was called Yo Mama. Oh, that, that's pretty good. There was a story <laughs> I wrote called... Uh, and I don't know what it was called, but it, Aliens had taken over Earth... And the human beings were all enslaved, and I, the character, the, the me character, the narrator of the story, Mary Sue, gets no, <laughs> gets taken before like this overlord of the aliens for entertainment, and like the aliens will pit oh, us against each okay. other. I know which one you're talking about, uh, right. and like Colosseum kind of things. This and, one and, was called "Dying Is Hard." Or no, come dying, dying is, is easy, easy is what That's it was what called. It was called. And I wrote this, and it felt like a very personal story, even though it's science fiction and all that. But this character, this main character, was so obviously me that I was just like, wow. I, this if I is... remember right, the main character's last name was Oldfield. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you couldn't and... make it more obviously that this guy is you. And anyhow, I was just like, you know, if we ever kill the Dune Steve, that's the last episode that I want. That's the last story that I want to run as like my swan song it's like this this story speaks for me from you know who i am and my sense of humor and all that stuff uh and so i was really really proud of it but you're the only person on earth who's ever read dying is easy yeah in the back of my mind it's just like okay that's that's one that's my strongest work kind of thing but somebody could read that and just be like yeah that's, that's so you know I, w I would like to have seen how the aliens took us over and all that stuff you you began the story way after where the story should have begun. But somebody else, you know, may feel that like, like, like it's really good. I don't know. You and I did this broken mirror. Yeah, I was going to say you're jumping ahead. So we finished our first live blogging exercise. And by the time we got to the end of this, I was pretty excited about writing. I, I had really enjoyed the process. I'd gotten comments from people, which is always helpful. And they were positive. There Generally. were people that were 
anticipating the next what happens next kind yeah of thing. and that feels good yeah i like i like to see that and that totally is what i was looking for when people would say oh come on man where's the next thing was exactly what i was after by publishing this that kind of pressure to keep going right every day don't stop because it's so easy to get too busy and when you have a moment just be like you know what i could write right now but i'd really rather just sit here maybe i'll put something on the tv and just kind of veg out instead of you know try and do something productive and right but when you feel that pressure then it's like oh crap i can't just sit here and veg out i gotta write at least 500 words or something you know to keep people tied over and so yeah i was really excited and i actually right after that i decided that I'm going to start doing this with a lot of things. And I, I mentioned this to you. I said, I think I'm going to start doing this. Like all the stories that I write, I'm just going to publish them first drafts on my blog, at least for the, you know, the time being until I get to the point where I'm in a habit and I write all the time and I don't have to have this artificial pressure. I'm, you know, I'm self-sufficient. But, you know, it's it's not, it's not wholly artificial you're creating new fans of your writing yeah, yeah, by putting your stuff out there who may go out and buy other stuff. You know what I mean? It's like there's no downside to what you're doing with unless you can come up with one. And the only one I can come up with is, you know, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? But Corey, Dr. Rowe puts out all of his work, as far as I know, under a Creative Commons license. So it's free. You can just take it and read it and listen to it or whatever it is for free although you have the option of going and buying an actual physical doctoral book and his philosophy is you're much more likely to suffer because nobody knows who you are than suffer because somebody doesn't pay for one of the things that you write or yeah. somebody rips off something piracy that you write. is not the biggest enemy of an of a writer these days obscurity is a much bigger enemy of a writer i think is what he's saying you know you don't need to worry so much about that and i the other thing that i've you know i used to kind of subscribe to this philosophy and this was before the possibility of self publishing existed really I used to hear people say, you know, don't publish something on the internet unless it's behind a password protected kind of a thing. You know, people can read it if they have the password, but if it's just out there on the internet, then people will consider that published and they won't buy your story for a magazine or for a anthology or whatever because it's been previously published. And I used to think oh yeah that's probably a, a good idea if i want to ever get paid to be a writer i need to sell my story to a magazine and they won't buy it so i was afraid to do that and one time i did publish one of my stories on my blog and i only left it up for like a week and i said hey everybody if you want to read this story read it but you better do it quick because i'm going to delete this post and then it'll be gone and that was following that idea that philosophy that hey this will be considered published if I leave it up on the internet. Now that story was, has been an episode on our show that was uh, through, the, through din the din of silence, and you know th that story is definitely published um, one way or another. But I could still publish it, uh, self-publish a text version of it, and you should, and I will, and I don't worry about that anymore. I don't care because I can just publish it. I don't need somebody else's seal of approval some editor to say oh this fits my idea of a good story to tell me that it's okay i can just say hey you know over the five how many six years whatever it is that we've been doing the show we've developed a certain number of fans and these certain number of fans might be interested in reading my book so i can just publish it and say hey fans here's a story of mine check it out if you want it and i don't have to worry so much about that kind of thing and maybe that's something that's exclusive to people like you and I who have had a show going for six years but I don't think so I think you can develop fans just by putting your stuff out you know that by having it out and available somebody might read it and that's how you develop a fan you can't get somebody to think you're a cool author until they read something that you've written so putting 
a story that I wrote on my blog, then the people who already think they're fans of mine can read it. And if they like it, they may well say, hey, dude, you need to check out this story. You can get it for free right now. It's on this guy's blog. Go and let, read it. It was cool. I loved it. You'll enjoy it, too. And that's the way you get fans is by, you know, somebody reads it and then they tell their friends, hey, this, I mean, that's always the best way. That's the way the most successful movies work. They have their big campaigns, their advertising and all that kind of stuff. But the ones that are truly successful are the ones where people go and watch it and then they go and talk to their friends the next day and say, hey, oh, I, I watched this movie the other day. You should go see it. It was so good. And then those people go and watch it and they say the same thing to their friends. And the word of mouth is what keeps a movie selling tickets for a long period of time the ad campaign only counts the opening weekend which everybody knows it doesn't mean anything you know it doesn't mean that it was a good movie when something got 90 million or whatever in its opening weekend that just means that it had a good ad campaign and it had maybe some name recognition or something like that something like the transformers movies can have big opening weekends but they're utter crap and nobody goes and says Oh, you should see this movie. It's so good. Optimus Prime says, No. And then he pulls out a sword and he fights with a sword. So rad. And there's explosions. And lots of jeeps. Well, you've sold me. That that sounds like a cool movie. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was saying that kind of, that we ought to keep doing this. And I was, I got really excited and I decided, okay, there's the idea that I've been talking about for a long time and I've even written 5,000 words probably on this story the story that's called Sunny and Gray which should eventually probably be a novel if I ever finish this thing and I decided okay I'm gonna force myself to finish this by publishing the first chapter on my blog and then after I write each story I have to write the next chapter of this book <laughs> and I keep going back to it until I've gotten to the end of it and so, yeah, I, I thought, okay, that's a good way to, again, motivate myself. And hopefully people will start bugging me when they're expecting the next chapter to show up and it hasn't shown up kind of a thing. And as soon as I published that, I was thinking, okay, it's time to write the next story. And you decided, hey, why don't we try a broken mirror type deal? I did. I, I mean, you and I seem to enjoy that kind of stuff. And we happened to write one just this year based on an old premise a discarded premise for one of our Dune Steve Broken Mirror events and so I I was at work and I texted you and said hey he, how about this for a Broken Mirror premise and I don't know if you liked it or if you're just like well I just need to write something but you you took up you accepted my uh, I took challenge. up the gauntlet I accepted the challenge and we both ended up writing a story based on I think the premise was, despite being warned about them, a child plays a claw... Vending machine. Vending machine and wins big. Uh-huh. Right? Is that yeah. pretty much the premise? And uh, I haven't read your story. and I guess you've finished writing and, and have started reading mine. I don't know if they're very similar or they're very different. It doesn't matter. That's how the broken mirror things work is... You never know what things are going to be parallel and what things are going to be wildly different if 10 different people write 10 different stories based on that same premise. You never know. That's part of the fun is to see what's similar and what's different. Right. And you even invited other people to join along. And I think at first everybody thought yeah. it was going to be a regular Broken Mirror contest. And For the Dune Steve. Yeah. yeah I, first, I should like, have worded, worded it different. <laughs> at first, like 20 people were like, yes, I'm in. And then when we told them how it was going to work, there uh, less people actually did it. Yeah, I, I think officially no one cared. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a few. Bria Burton uh, did write uh, her story and, and join along with us. Um, and I'm partway through reading her story, too. I'm, I'm kind of partway through several of them. Did she finish? I don't know if she's finished yet. I... You tell me that you're finished, but I didn't know that for sure either because I haven't finished reading it. Uh, I did get up to a certain point where it, that was as far as you had published up to that point. Huh. And uh, I had to stop um, until the next one came out. 
Uh, I also started reading Bria's, and Catherine Inskip oh, cool. has joined. She joined, like, right near the end. I was about done with my story, and then all of a sudden she finally had started hers. So I threw the links to all those stories are available on our blog posts uh, for this contest. So you can go and find your way to all the stories and read the the four different takes. And it's possible that there may still be other. I know Void Munashi was trying to uh, come up with a story that he liked that went with that concept. And I think he'd started a couple and they wound up going flat on him. And he was going to try again. Um, but I don't know. I know that he, when we did our triple word score contest he said he wrote like three or four different stories using his uh three words that he got and the one that he actually liked was the one that we saw what could be worse than murray's chinese cuisine where you could get your chow mein over french fries <laughs> yum everybody loves french fries uh, you're joking right but see that's really impressive if somebody writes three or four different stories based on that premise because it makes me wonder, okay, well, how many stories does this guy have? And is he doing the same thing? If, if you liked the story we published on the Doonstief by Void, can you read the other three or four stories? <laughs> does he publish everything that he writes in the way that Dean Wesley Smith suggests? These are questions that no one can answer. Not even Void. No. but It would be interesting to see something like that, a broken mirror collection from Void Munashi, where it's all the different versions <laughs> of the three-word story that he did. Not three-word story, but his triple-word score story that he did. But yeah, so you sent me that text, and we both started writing. I came up with an idea for it. I was about to leave a town for a family reunion that I had to go to. And so I have a tablet that has that came with a keyboard attachment to it so it's almost like a laptop computer basically and I made sure to take this thing with me and I turned it all the way off I think I even brought the charger along with me but I you know charged it all the way up turned it all the way off so that I would not run out of battery because I know that uh, while we were there electricity was going to be sketchy like we got it for some hours of the day from a generator because we were staying at a cabin deep in the woods somewhere so I was afraid that I might not be able to continue this but yeah I had it all set up on my tablet I wrote it in the Google Docs program I downloaded the app for that so that you can write and then when you get home and get connected to the internet, all that stuff that you write just automatically gets uploaded and added to your cloud of storage or whatever. And so that was cool. You know, it's a little easier than the, the format that Rich tends to use, which is writing in a notebook, and then you have to retype it up later. And yeah, so I went to my family reunion, and I wound up finding the time to be able to get 1500 words or so on this story written in before I came back and so when we started publishing this I was actually like several days ahead for once you know when I wrote the other story which was called Fireflies the first one that I did live blogged onto my uh, website that one I was writing as I did it you know I'd write stuff and then I would copy that text and paste it into the blog post and publish it and um in this case, I was one or two days, three or four days ahead for a while till the thing finally caught up with me. And then I was back to just getting it done barely in time. But yeah, that was fun. And it turned out to be some 7,000 words worth of a story that I wrote. Yeah, you had been telling me it was going to be really short. 7,000 is not well, short. Well, that's short compared to Fireflies, which I wrote just before it, which was 17,000 words. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought it would be shorter than it turned out to be, but I kept adding in stupid little things. One of the things that I thought was fun to do is I named a lot of the characters after all the people who had commented on my first story that I'd blogged on there. So there's a character that's named Tina. Because a listener named Tina would comment, the main character's last name is Burton because Bria Burton would read my story and comment, and so on and so on. Uh, Jason, I think, was another character in there because Jason Cavella had been reading and commenting. So, you know, it was kind of my way to say, hey, thanks for, you know, being a part of this. 
and I thought it was fun. Um, so yeah, right now we've gotten to the point where I'm done with that story, and I need to do another chapter of, of Sunny and Gray. Gray. I did type uh, like 300 words on that today. But oh, good. 300 words is better than not. Yes, that's true. I have to admit, I feel a little daunted because I'm writing just a chapter of a whole book. Mm. Something about writing a whole book, it's kind of scary. I, I know agree. that there are a lot of people, that that's all they do and that's all they've ever done. They've never written a short story or whatever. Or they can't do it. And, you know, there's people like Abigail Hilton who, you know, writes 800-page books and short stories that are 2,000 words or less, but she can't manage to do anything in between, I think is what she said once. You know, she can't do a short story. She can only do a flash story or a ginormous novel. I don't know. The, the novel thing scares me. It, it, I feel like I will get lost. Yeah. And I'm afraid to start into it because, you know, it's one thing to be 7,000 words into a story and then think, crap, I don't know where, what to do with this and abandon it. Seems like it'd be an entirely other thing to be 50,000 words into a novel and think, oh, crap, I don't know what I'm going to do with this and abandon it. That's like, you know, I mean, that's 10 short stories that you're just throwing away instead of one. It scares me, but I still feel like it's something that I should do. I need to do. I need to eventually take that step. So I'm going to try and force myself to do it. I forced myself to write those 300 words because I was sitting there thinking, oh, well, maybe I should work on the character bios a little more and maybe plot out some more stuff and, uh, you know. It's the thing that Dean Wesley Smith said in one of his little bits of advice. Don't keep researching stuff for your idea as an excuse to not write. If you're still researching instead of writing after, you know, a certain period of time, you know, it's time that you just need to give up the research and write the damn thing. Because researching is not writing and you don't become a better writer by researching your prose is still going to suck no matter how well researched it is so i forced myself to write those 300 words anyways and i guess i'll have to keep going from there well okay so you're going to write another chapter of sunny and gray which you've got 300 words of mm -hmm. publish that and then you're going to start writing another story live blog yep that's my plan uh so by the time this comes out that's already happened though i mean we always jinx ourselves by doing this <laughs> but possibly yeah it, it it should be because uh, you know a book chapter is about five th it's like the it's like a short story length it's like five thousand words or so is what a regular book chapter is and so once i get there i'll publish that chapter and then uh, yeah i will get back to my and my next the story that i plan to write next my tentative title for it is do-over oh, okay i know which one though and it's the grand canyon story and it is the grand canyon story although that's relatively early on in the story right but that doesn't so spoil it doesn't to spoil call it anything grand very story. good so um, the grand canyon story is coming and yeah if you write that that probably puts this 2014 as your most productive year ever I mean, maybe maybe you, there's been a year that you've written five stories, but I know you've written three stories so far that I can think of. Maybe there's a fourth out there, I don't know. Yeah, that would be my fourth story. I, I actually went through, when I was getting into that, looked in my folders, because my stories, I have them organized. In, this is an idea that you gave me. The year that I wrote the story, I made a folder by year, and I put all the stories into that years folder and I was looking through several folders and I think the actual the one that I was most productive my biggest year ever for writing was 2008 in which I wrote six stories oh that you really gotta work year. Yeah. well see you also owe us 
a story for the 13 weeks of nights of Halloween. So keep that in mind too. Oh boy. Yeah. I'll Although it doesn't have to be that. something you write specifically for the Halloween show. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. I don't know if I have an idea that I can just pull. I might need a broken <laughs> mirror uh, premise for that. But yeah, that's what I'm hoping to do. You know, the, the sad thing is, I was looking at that, and 2008 was the year we started the podcast. Mm -hmm. And all those six stories had been written in the first half of 2008. The second half of 2008 is when we started the podcast. Well, all of your and free time was taken up by... my entire life was eaten by that podcast. I spent every second of spare time doing audio production for the podcast. And, yeah, I did no more writing. I could have written a damn lot of stories that year had I uh, never gotten into this black time hole suck that the show has turned out to be but the show has also turned out to be very positive and other things so i'm not going to complain about that yeah we could do a dune steve episode uh, you know it's too bad we don't do anniversary shows and stuff like that but it, where we talk about like the positives and negatives of having the podcast and, and what they they were but i find that doing audiobooks for money i almost said professionally i, I don't want to be a liar it doesn't feel creatively satisfying but doing the dune steef is creatively fat satisfying you know what i mean uh -huh. doing that gets my goat is creatively satisfying because we're just making things up where i'm making up jokes i write sketches i try to make people laugh we we try to come up with interesting points and observations about the story and all that stuff and that's what you do with writing um but just reading and performing somebody else's work uh, that doesn't check that box for me uh huh. But so yes, if if I hadn't started the Dune Steve, I also probably would have a lot more out there that I had written. Well, it wouldn't be out there, you know that. <laughs> but it would be written. Uh, yeah, I think but that it's a the balance, Dune Steve you know? is one of those things. The reason you actually do have stuff out there is because of the Dune Steve. Whereas otherwise, it would be completely obscure still to this day. Yeah, it's a positive and a negative. But one thing that I wanted to talk about, and, and see, I haven't read your story, so I'm at a disadvantage. But you shared with me about halfway through the story that you weren't really pleased with where it was going, or you weren't really pleased with the writing, or you weren't really pleased with the story. And I had that exact same feeling while I was writing it. And there was probably a seven or eight day stretch where I didn't publish anything because I just didn't care. I was just like, oh, great, this isn't going to be good. Why did I get into this? shoot you know now i'm embarrassed <laughs> but it was evident from the very beginning on my story my story is called magic claw and it was in my mind i okay i i want to have there be two boys and one of them is really into playing this claw game and the other one thinks that it's a waste of time and by the end of the story i want the roles to reverse but I didn't know how I wanted to end it. And so I, I was sitting and I, 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 you know, sort of sketching out and then this could happen and then this could happen and it could go this way or that way. And I thought, and if it goes this way, it ends like this. And it sort of fell flat. And in the, the, the back of my mind is like, you know, that ending is fine. <laughs> the term I used was perfectly cromulent, uh -huh. which is a Simpsons reference from 25 years ago now. But perfectly cromulent in my mind means it's just like yeah that's adequate that's totally acceptable or whatever but it's not great and i thought well do i want to go with that because if i'm going to go with that then i'll just write the dang story with that ending in mind or do i want to work harder and try and come up with something that is great and it was a quandary it was something that i didn't know what the correct answer was and if you and I were professional writers and we owed, let's say, our publisher X number of, of books or, or stories or somebody hired us to be or I don't know how that, that works, but we get picked to be part of an anthology and we have to write the Magic Claw story for the anthology. And in the back of your mind, you know that it's going to sell no matter what. It's already been bought by the editor of the anthology. So... It doesn't matter if it's a great story or not. You can half-ass it and send it in and it gets published either way. You've got a contract. What is the benefit of breaking your back over this thing 
And do real writers ever experience this? You know what I mean? Where it's just like, okay, Del Rey, I owe them three more books. And I've got this one that's that's not going so well, but all I have to do is push through to the end, and that's one of the three down. And then I'll work harder on the other two, or, or maybe I'll be inspired on the other two. And, uh, you know, not being a real writer, I don't know what the answer is on this. And, and you know, there are very few writers that are in the league to have this problem where they owe three more books on their contract or whatever and they have to decide to sell out (laughs) or do the Christmas album. Yeah, Uh, okay. (laughs) Musicians do this a lot. We can put out a greatest hits where maybe we we write one new song or maybe we don't even do it. Maybe it's one of those 10 track things and it's all old and we don't even pick the tracks. We just see what the top charting hits were and we have somebody put up together album art and we just cash the checks. And there are some musicians that are just like, no, I, that's the last thing I want to do. I want to write new music and I don't want to just force myself to write new music. I want to write stuff about uh, that I'm passionate about. I want these to be the best songs ever. Anyway, I I don't know what the answer is. For Magic Claw, once I got to the end, I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's the story. It's not great. What am I going to do about it? But then I started to wonder, well, maybe there was never a great story in that premise to begin with. Because I, you had said, you know, yeah, I'm not sure that my story is all that good. Which is exactly my feeling for my story as well. Maybe it's the premise's fault. Yeah, I think it depends like you were saying about a real author what would they do and would they just push through to the end and say here you go you know make another mark on the wall I'm, I'm down you know now there's just three left on my contract kind of a thing some writers might do that the problem with that kind of stuff is usually there's a way out for the publisher you know when your book doesn't sell well enough they can okay well you know what the rest of the contract is now void and you don't get any more money uh thanks for doing business we'll not talk again you know and by by putting out substandard stuff you're just hurting yourself because people are not you're not going to get that word of mouth nobody's going to say hey i read the new big anklevich story and it's good you should check it out so it can be detrimental, I think, to do something like that, to not put in the extra work. At least when you're at that level, or at least probably a higher level than you or I are at, where just the act of finishing the story is kind of a mini victory for us. You know, we didn't give up, we didn't quit halfway, we finished it, we wrote it through, and we now have that experience of the end you know writing the end and and getting to it and knowing what that's like and uh, being able to deal with writing endings and knowing that okay this ending isn't good it's not satisfying because of this or whatever and we learn something from that but also it could be detrimental still because we're putting it out there and we're saying, hey, everybody, look, I wrote this story. Here, read it. And then they read it and they go, oh, well, that wasn't very good. I guess I don't have to come back to this blog always and read the stories because they're not always going to be good. Sometimes they're going to suck, suck balls. balls. Okay, but you wouldn't say the Dr. Claw sucks balls, right? No, it's not that bad. Yeah, Magic Claw doesn't suck, suck balls. balls. Now, that would be an interesting experiment I think if I was about halfway through and the specter of this story sucking balls came over me, I would just be like, oh, hey, I'm sorry, guys. I can't continue this. There's no point in reaching the end if a story is that bad. That's probably true. But again, if we were real writers and we got a paycheck once you reached the end and you knew that this story is going to suck balls, but... You're going to be able to buy school clothes for your fudging kids if you reach the end. Wouldn't you not just force your way through to the end and say, yeah, it sucked balls. But look, she's got f***ing clothes on. I might. I don't know. It's hard to say. 
because again, you know, every story that you publish, somebody's going to read that and you have no other way of building readership and fans and selling more. You know, the more stuff you put out that sucks balls, yeah, maybe you got your 500 bucks for it today, but down the line you're not going to get 5,000 bucks for a different story or whatever. You know, it's not going to build if you give in to that. So it seems like it would probably be a bad idea in the end. You know, it's when you worry about the short-term gain now and you throw out the opportunity for the long term for the big score down the line because of it it seems like that could be a bad idea i don't know i don't know it's hard to say and yeah i don't know also is it the idea is there an amazing story out there i guess well i believe there is i believe that the right writer with the right inspiration could write the best story you ever heard or, or saw i guess based on the magic claw premise and I don't know how how you find that. If you're Void Munashi, I guess you try three times before you get to the fourth one where it's just like, yeah, I did it. But... Okay, how much back-breaking labor do you do based on the, the claw machine prompt? Or do you just say, okay, hey, you know what? I wrote a cromulent story maybe inspiration will strike on the next one. I'm moving on to the next one because why kill myself over this little story? Yeah, I think there is, the, especially for Dean Wesley I, Smith would say that, too. Yeah. He would say, okay, you know that it wasn't great? Analyze why it wasn't great, but don't waste any more time on this story that wasn't great. Yeah. His deal is write. You have to keep writing because the more you write, the better you get. So... You write this story, and then if it wasn't great, okay, it wasn't great. Figure out why it wasn't great and apply the lessons that you learned in the next story that you write. You know, that's his thing is just keep writing and always, as you write, be working on making something better in your writing. Whatever it may be, work on that. I don't know. Well, see, that's a question. I, I wish that we were in a room... Like, when, the only time we're ever around other creative people, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's at the New Media Expo. I can't think of another time, because I don't go to writer's groups or anything like that, and we don't have a creative writing class that we go to. Although years ago, we did talk about enrolling in one, and that would have been fun. But the only time I'm ever around creative people is at the New Media Expo, and I would love to sit them down and say, okay, somebody asks you, okay, you get to you, you have to write a story, and... You know, a guy sells his soul to the devil and he lives it up and he has all this fun. And then at the end of the time comes and the devil comes to claim his soul. And then an angel comes and says, you're forgetting one thing, love. And the contract is, br is <laughs> null and void. And, and that's how Faust ends. You have to write that. As shitty as that ending is, the worst ending of any story ever written in humankind. And, and I will give you money if you will write it. How many in the room would take the money and do it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unapologetic. I would do it. To be paid for my writing, even if it's a crappy story and I know that it's crappy, the money spends the same, <laughs> whether it's good or bad. Now, what you said about, you know, other people are going to read this and be like, what? You're forgetting one thing, love? An infant wrote that. You know, I, I am insulted. You know, I'm no longer going to church because of this story you have written. <laughs> That's Fallout, but at the same time, I'd be like, yeah, hey, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, that was a premise I was given. I wrote the best story I could, knowing that that were where it was, where, where was going to go. And you're like, your character, Faust, killed and ate children. And then he's forgiven at the end because of love. And I was like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The, the, he originally raped, killed, and ate children, but uh, I toned it down in a rewrite. And then it's like, how, how do you defend yourself? And I was like, well, I cashed the check. That's how I defend myself. Anyway, maybe all of this should be an outtake, but it's a question I, I, I asked myself while writing the, the, the Claw story. You know, if, if I didn't feel confident in it and I didn't feel like it was my best work, and maybe, maybe what if I knew that this ending just sucked? But if I sat and concentrated and thought about it for hours and hours and mentally sweated, I would come up with something good rather than this sucky ending. But it would take all of that effort would I do it? 
And, you know, again, there's a difference between every person. Some people would be like, no, it, uh, you know, I'm not doing, there are, there are plenty of good stories. I'm not being paid for those. I'm being paid for this one. This story takes precedence. Uh, you in my doing my audiobook stuff. Sometimes the books aren't really all that good. But do I deliver a weaker audiobook or performance or whatever? Do I do I give them my B game instead of my A game if I know that the book sucks? And that's a question that, again that only I can answer, but it's like, well, I I said I would do it. I'm it's still an example of my work and my ability as a narrator, don't I owe it to anybody who happens to buy this because they like me to do the best I can with it? Or maybe not. I mean, maybe you can only polish a turd so much. It's never going to look like an emerald. I don't know. This probably should have been its own episode <laughs> because it's a topic where I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. If Marshall Latham was doing an Edgar Allan Poe contest again next year and you wrote a story and you're just like wow this story is awful but it happens to be called Lenore and I wrote it for a Marshall Latham wouldn't you still send it to him even though you knew it was bad because you wrote it for his contest it's like if you don't send it to him what did you do it for the hell of it well Okay, well, I, I if, know these are several questions, and I didn't give you time to answer any of them. Can you address anything? If nothing else, at least you learned something from writing and you wrote. It's a bummer when you're writing something and you realize, nah, I don't know that this is going to be very good. And when you get to the end and you write the end and you're like, nah. And that's the best, you know, you can say for it. That, that really is a bummer. But I, I assume I would send it to Marshall Latham for his contest, but... Even if I decided, no, this is too terrible, I'm too embarrassed. If Marshall accepted it, then people would hear it, and I would rather they not because it's that bad, then I probably wouldn't send it. But at least I, I could say, hey, I wrote a story. There's several stories that I've done that with. I wrote the story, and I get to the end, and then one of them I wrote this year, and it wasn't Dr. Claw. It was a different story called Bumblebee, which no one will ever read. Because it was terrible. I will read it. Wait, wh wh when did you write the suicide story? Oh, the suicide story I wrote uh, last year, I think. Oh, okay. I was going to say, well, shoot. That's that's five stories you've written. But... Why will no one ever read Bumblebee? Uh, because it's terrible, and I hate it. It was a bad story premise, a bad story idea, and poorly executed. But... <laughs> In the end, it was you covered all the bases. It was a finished story, and so I can say, "Hey, I wrote this story, and I got the experience of writing a story." You know, just trying to tell a, a scene or whatever is is something. So I don't call it a waste of time or a, a complete loss, uh, even though it's just going to sit in the cloud and do nothing but rain on people. But wait, one day you're going to put to, out an anthology called. Ankle Vision. 15 stories by Big Anklevich. And uh, is there no chance that you'll throw Bumblebee in there if you've got 12 st stories that you do like? <laughs> Probably not. Wow, you really despise this story. I don't think it's it's worth... Sh I would have to do some serious work on it. I don't know that there's any way to make it worth reading. It's one of those kind of stories... Like a bad movie where you sit through it and then you want your two hours back from sitting mm. through that damn movie. You would want your, I don't know how long it would take to read the, the probably only an hour or less to read the whole story. But yeah, you would want your time back for it because it's, it's not worth it. But anyways, yeah, I don't consider that a, a waste of time. At the very least, I wrote the story. You know, that's something. I can I can add it to my list, and when I get to the end of the year, I can say, hey, I wrote six stories or seven st Hopefully, I read, write seven, and I beat my record. Okay, but somebody hears this podcast, and they send you an email, and they say, I'm doing an anthology of Transformers-related stories, and you've written a story called Bumblebee. I'll give you $100 to let me <laughs> publish Bumblebee in my anthology. What do you say? I would say, can I publish it under a pseudonym? <laughs> How about uh, Jim 
slip. I don't know. Just make up a name and see if he can uh, publish it under that name. Maybe then I can get the hundred bucks for it. But I doubt that somebody. Geez, what is that bird doing? There's a bird that is having intercourse right outside the window here. I don't know if you can hear I'm glad this or someone not. is. It's, it's really having a good time out there. But yeah, I don't know that I could... And it's not Transformers related, really. <laughs> okay. So the title may be Transformers related, and there is a slight mention of Transformers because of the Bumblebee thing, but it's only barely Transformers related. So I don't know if it would fit. Okay. So his anthology is auto-erotic stories. <laughs> and you're like, wow, that's clever because would you be more willing to? And they're all under pseudonyms. In that case, yeah, I would t I'd take the hundred bucks and just give him the story under a pseudonym. It's worth it to write whatever you do because you learn something from it. I think one of the things that Dean Wesley Smith would say is that you need to have, you when you're writing... It's practice, but it needs to be uh, practice with a purpose. You know what I mean? If you're just writing and writing and writing and writing and you're never thinking, okay, I need to work on this particular thing when I write this story because this thing is what I'm lacking in, then you, your writing will never improve. You'll just write more of the same garbage and you won't become a better writer so I think it's called focused practice is what he calls it where you're trying to write on a particular you know improve a particular thing when you write so there's that this whole process it's interesting because it has made me feel excited about writing again it's only August right now as we record so that leaves me several months left in the year and I think I could easily if I keep this up easily surpass my best year ever in story totals and probably my best year ever in number of quality stories as well despite the fact that I only feel that so far of the three that I've written Fireflies is probably the only one that I think is an actual good quality story I think by the end of the year I could write several that would fall into that uh... did you have anybody say they liked Dr. Claw more than Fireflies? No, I haven't gotten a lot of comments yet on Dr. Claw. I think I usually open it up for comments at on the, the end. at the end. Did you do your postmortem? I did. Yeah, I talked a little bit about it and uh, I started mine today too. I think Marshall has commented already on it, but so far nobody else yet has commented on the, the finale. See, Marshall tried to participate in the first live blogging exercise. And he had never written a horror story before. And I know that that really intimidated him. But see, that feels like a focused practice to me. It's just like, okay, I'm going to try and write a horror story. And even if it's not a good story, if he reaches the end on, it, you know, on his very first time doing a horror story, then that's a success. Even if, okay, it's not scary or even if it meanders or, you know, even if it's, 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 it's pretty bad he achieved you know his first horror story which is way more valuable than four attempts at writing something where you give up halfway through i don't know i i i felt bad for him because he i know that he wanted encouragement uh, but my story was so dang long that it just it took so it took over a month i think for me to do mine yeah it's surprising how much effort a long story like the ones that you and I tend to write can be how much of a pain that can turn to turn out to be I mean mine being um, I think it was a little shy of 17,000 words and that took a long time to get through it okay. you know I'm not really a, a, a pro gun kind of guy but uh... <laughs> you're thinking about getting a BB gun just for that bird I just want to scare it away, really, but... Oh, so BB gun's not right. Quite what you're just, after. Just, yeah, uh, a blunderbuss, Here. Ready? Maybe. Wait, what's that? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, there's somebody right there. Oh, there is. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't think it was on. There was a mugging in progress, and you interrupted it. That, look at that. Uh, that the guy nice. got away with his wallet, thanks to you. What? That was just inconsiderate. Sorry! 
Anyway. It didn't scare the bird away, though, unfortunately. Oh, well. Well, I see. I feel like we've opened up the door to several topics, but I don't know that we've closed the door on any of them, except for the... For me, well, the practice that I need isn't finishing stories, isn't writing horror stories, isn't writing stories. It's sharing my work. It's it's putting it out there and saying, you know, this is what I've written. If you want to judge it, you can. If you want to criticize it, I can't stop you. You know, I, I live in fear of the criticism. And what I need to do is just put it out there. I mean, even if it is not a good story... I've got to just put it out there. And so, you know, that's been one positive from doing this live blogging thing. Plus, I, a lot of people really liked my first story. Uh, and so, you know, that's cool. And eventually, if I ever get off my ass and do cover art for it, you know, I will sell that story. You know how it is. What would you put as your cover art? Um, I would going to have a, a girl's face and there's an aquarium in front of it or fish tank and you see fish and she's looking at the fish that's what I but I did do a drawing like and I meant to do it in crayons of just her name that was going to be the, the thing that was on her door that was going to be my temporary thing so I could just get it out there and make a real cover with the face later but yeah it's still just in pencil I gave up on that yeah I, I, cover art is my black beast <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just, cover art is my nemesis. It's my stumbling block. It is supplanted fear of rejection. <laughs> cover art is my new, yeah. Well, uh, maybe I'll is have to Bet see Moore? what I can do for you for your cover. The, the only problem I have with cover art is I don't know what the specs are supposed to be for it, what size it's supposed to be, what shape it's supposed to be. Hmm. Etc. I know that there are a few different trains of thought out there. You can have it be a certain size. It can be two by three, three by four, etc. And uh, yeah, I don't know what exactly people want. That's one of those things that I need to figure out. Uh, I do want to get going on getting stories available for people to buy. Wait, did, not to interrupt, didn't you say Dean Wesley Smith put out a book that was just about cover art for your self-publishing? Um, I think he's done blog posts just oh, okay. about, and he, I think he actually does workshops where you can pay and That's go what out it is. there. The workshop and, is and, just about cover art. And just learn how to make covers for your self-published stuff. So there's that. I think he lives in Portland or somewhere close to somewhere in Oregon anyways so maybe Marshall would put us up go out there stay with Marshall and then go to the uh, cover art workshop <laughs> to be able to finally kill your bet noir it would be worth it for me if I could slay that particular beast because yeah you know how many stories I have out there and a lot of them are like they are formatted for Amazon they're all ready to go and just sitting Waiting for cover art. Ugh. Tell me some of the titles of those. At the very least, they can be the quick and easy covers that you just put it out there with. You have designed me a couple of covers that were perfectly cromulent, if you will. <laughs> Again, I, this is, I feel like this. I'm recording a rerun right here because I've complained about cover art many times in the past. But it's like it's supposed to sum up in one photo how you're supposed to feel, what the genre is, what the story is about. You know what I mean? And so I have a cousin who is sort of the inspiration for the character of Brecken in A Lovely Singing Voice. And I considered finding a picture of her and asking you to superimpose aquarium fish over her picture. But then I was just like, no, you know, the, the real Brecken is Mexican and super fat. That's not the character that I describe in this story. It's like, how am I going to do that? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to Photoshop alter the actual Brecken's face and change her hair color and then send you. And it's just like, no, I'm never going to do anything. Yeah, things. you're not going to do that. <laughs> the key, at least to begin with, is just finding. And the, and the, the my answer to that is just, you know, the, the flicker has a billion photos to choose from. 
and you can find something that will be perfectly cromulent for any story you know you just think okay I want this and I've used it dozens of times for cover art for our podcast itself and you know there's pictures that are available for commercial use all you got to do is credit the, the person who took the picture see that seems like it would be fun to go through those pictures and you've described that experience as being not torturous of going through pictures trying to find something but I would rather sit down and draw a picture than to go through and look through Flickr. What is wrong with me? Why, why is that? I don't know. But if you work on it, I think you can easily learn it. It's not really that hard. And you can... Is it make... Flickr? Yes. Okay. And you can make cromulent covers. They're not great, I'm sure. There is better. And I've seen self-published covers i've seen covers that dean wesley smith did and i don't know if these were he he does talk a lot on his website about how you know when he first started doing self-publishing and he made covers he just says they were absolute shit and he cringes when he sees when he looks back and sees these covers that he published as his stuff under but sorry that's exactly what we were talking about though is it better to put it out so somebody could buy it with a shitty cover, then for it to wait and not be on sale because you're trying to find the perfect cover. And, that, and that's a question. Maybe Dean Wesley Smith can answer it. Maybe you can't. What he says is it's, it's a learning thing. Your, your early covers are going to be shitty. It's just the deal. And you're going to learn from them and learn from them. And the more you do it, the better they're going to get. And the good thing about self-publishing is at any time you can just replace the old file with a new file. If you find typos, you can get rid of them and replace the old file with a new file. When you do a better cover for your book, you can just put that new cover in and replace the old file with the new file. And now it's not shitty. And see, that's really encouraging. I mean, that's a really good thing. Anybody out there who has self-published something, it's not set in stone. You can go there and you know what I mean? You can add to it. You can alter it. You can expand and revise and all that stuff. You know, I'm sure Dean Wesley Smith doesn't want you to do that, but don't let him stop you. Uh, just the, <laughs> the, the thought that you can put out a rough version of and then when somebody tells you, hey, I found this list of typos, you can retract to that and fix those and put it out there. I mean, it takes no time at all. You can do that not in an afternoon, not in an hour, but in like 20 minutes. See, to me, that's really fun, too. And there have been a couple of covers that I made myself that were really, really awful. And I, you made a cover for me that would supplant it or, or somebody suggested or Gino Moretto said, hey, here, try this. And, and it's easy to just replace them with the superior cover. And I don't know if that's going to sell more than the inferior cover, but it was easy. I mean, it's one less thing to worry about, too. And a crappy cover, I guess, could haunt you, could be a, a smudge on an otherwise really good story. You know, it's better that it's out there with a crappy cover than it's not out there at all. Yeah, I agree. This is an, uh, an aside, but if you guys want to go out there and buy a story I wrote called Birth of a Sidekick, it is out there on Amazon right now. And it sat for months and months. I probably, what do you call it, formatted it for Amazon.com September or October of 2013. And it just sat because I didn't have a cover for it. Uh, and then a, uh, a fan of the show, Dave Krummenacher, uh, whose name is impossible to pronounce. He did just, just wonderful cover art for it. And it's like the day that I got that cover art, it's like, okay, that's going up right now. And so, yeah, you can go there and you can see that. And that one is one where I don't cringe when I see the cover art. I'm just like, wow, I'm happy to send people out there. The cover art is stronger than the story, <laughs> <laughs> but the story is good. That's one that you've actually shared with me. I've read it and I enjoyed it. This is a Western, which I guess still counts as a genre story. <laughs> it is, Westerns but are genres. It is unlike other stuff that I've written. And so I hope that people go out there and buy it. And, and certainly that good cover art is going to help. But I don't know. I mean, we've all seen paperback 
science fiction books or horror books or whatever that have just a great cover and the inside is is crap. But once you've bought them, they've done their job. They win. I don't know. Again, that was probably something I should have cut out. But it's just... <laughs> I, I, well, I enjoyed I, that story. I'm myself. happy to have it out there published. And uh, I guess by the time this comes out, it's out on audible.com too. You can listen to it. And it did nobody any good. You, I think, are the only person in the world who had read that story uh, until Dave came along. And so if if he hadn't come along, it would have been two people in the world who had read that. Yeah. And now it's four. And that's good that it's jumped all the way. It's doubled. <laughs> Just think of it that way. It's doubled. But yeah, it's a good story. So if you're listening to this show and you're interested in picking up something from written by Rish Outfield, you can go on Amazon and get that story. And I, I thought it was a good story. It didn't do what I thought it would do. It I was always, supposed to do what you thought it would do, and it didn't. Which I always like when a story doesn't just, you know, serve up exactly what you expected. Um, so, yeah, this has been kind of a really far-reaching, broad, kind of rambly show about writing, it seems. Well, I like it. One in three is this, right? Yeah, that's probably <laughs> We're really true. passionate about writing, and yet it's it's a learning experience. It's a it's it's a journey. It's not a destination. <laughs> I don't know what they call it. It's it's a journey. It's not a foreigner or a survivor. Yeah. And so uh, I don't know. I see uh, ten years from now still talking like this about writing, still learning new things, still making observations, and being like, wow. I, I didn't. I, I don't know what a real writer would do in a case like this. <laughs> Maybe in ten years we will call ourselves real writers, and we'll have to say, "I don't know what a successful writer would do." <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully, if I can keep this up and keep writing the way I have been for the last month and a half, ten years from now, I, I would think that I would feel. I would consider myself a real writer by then if I kept up this pace. And yeah, hopefully, I mean, like I was saying, I am excited about writing. I have to admit that I'm a, I, this next chapter of Sunny and Gray has slowed me, has scared me, has daunted me. But I'm still excited about writing, and I really look forward to getting through this chapter and then getting on to Do Over and writing that story. And I have lots of ideas in my head for stories that I've meant to write for years. And if I can keep this pace up, I can actually get to those. You know, that, that story that I wrote a couple years ago called The Battle of the Ideas, you know, that was based on that whole problem that I have where I come up with ideas, but I don't write the stories. And, you know, when that character finally gets to the point where he gets writing and he's like writing the ideas and he's setting these these ideas free into the world I feel like I could finally be that guy I can start setting my ideas free all these ones that I've had trapped in my head you know and I don't really have to stop and think okay what am I going to write next shoot I don't know I don't have any ideas I've got dozens of them just waiting to go the real trouble is picking which one I'm most excited about next and yeah, I, I as long as I can keep up this writing pace, I, I can really get somewhere with these, and I, I will feel excited. There's another story idea really similar to Do Over that I was also thinking about writing this year that I was thinking I would call Undo. Wow, <laughs> you don't want to write those too close together because you'll be like, wait, um, oh wait, the first which, one, which was... one was which? Shoot. I'm excited about it, and I I hope that. It interests you guys that are listening. Uh, you can check it out, BigAnklevich.blogspot.com. You can come and read. Um, I've been making sure to label all the posts that go with each particular story with a label. So if you come in and you want to read the whole story, you can just click on the label and it'll give you all the posts that go to that story. And you can read the one story all the way through. That's a really good idea. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it i mean if nothing else it's free stories if you like listening to our podcast you probably like the stories that rish and i write and pick so you know it's just another way to get more of our stuff and it's free so go and check it out and if you are reading comment 
Don't tell us anything. You guys fucking suck. Uh, true as that may be. Yeah, true as that may be. Don't do that because that'll kill our momentum. But comment. You don't have to. If you don't like it, don't say anything about the story. But do say, hey, I read your story. Thanks for giving me a free story or whatever the hell you want to say without saying it sucks. Uh, just let us know that you're there. Let us know that you read. That would be neat. The more people that we know are reading, the more likely we are to keep at it. Uh, Marshall sent me an email the other day, and he's like, "Dude, it's been a week, and you haven't, you haven't written your daily story. What's going on?" And yeah, I emailed him, and I was like, "Oh, I will, I will. I'm sorry, but if he hadn't sent me that email, it probably would have been eight or nine days instead of seven days, you know." Cool. I will keep doing that too, then, because yeah, I should have bugged you for uh, the end of your story because I got to the certain point and then there was no more and I'm like, damn it! Now I have to wait. Well, I also had three or four other things that, dang it, I wish we had a four-hour show so I could tell you that my Masters of the Macabre story went up, that a, a story that I read for Farfetch'd Fables went up, and there was a third thing. Oh, I, I did a Rich Outcast that went up just in the same week. And so, you know, it was all the more excuse I had not to continue the daily writing thing. All right. Remind me to put links to those when you send me the email. Well, I can cut this that little part out if you No, want. I'll leave it in and then tell me to put links to it. And I'll <laughs> put them all in the uh, links part of the post. Okay. Okay, sorry. I'm yawning. That must mean it's getting late. Well, I was up very, very late last night and then I had to work this morning. And so I'm not as old as I used to be. You're even older. <laughs> and now I'm even older. <laughs> That's right. Hey, I appreciate whoever is still listening. You too have become older while listening to That Gets My Goat. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you again next time. Be well. That Gets My Goat on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone... But you cannot change it or make money off it. You guys fucking suck. <laughs> For some reason, that struck me as tremendously funny. <laughs> that somebody would send an email that just said that in, like, all caps. Thanks for spending time with us. Balls. Okay, but you wouldn't say that whatever the hell your story is called. Dr. Claw. Oh, whoops. You wouldn't say that Dr. Cock, cock sucks balls, right?